today I'm joined by this cup of coffee um, and also by St. Joseph and the child Jesus here. So um, Later on when you get bored or frustrated because I'm rambling, you can share an exasperated look with the patron of the church there. St. Joseph, pray for us. Uh, welcome uh, to this fifth video, this fifth chapter of um, the Sources of Christian Ethics. Uh, reflection, uh, summarization. Um, this is again by uh, the not French, the Belgian Dominican, Cervase Pinkeris, Father Cervase Pinkeris. Um, of course, he's writing in French, but I learned recently that he's Belgian, so the more you know. Um, a quick recap once again. Uh, the introduction and chapter one of the book were um, defining Christian ethics and identifying the recent trend of, of obligation-based systems in moral ethics. Watch chapter or the, the first video in the series for that. Chapter two uh, identified how uh, an ethics not based on obligation but on like the flourishing of human life touches all the different aspects of human life. So it talks about um, sin and. Um, virtue and all the all the areas of life that are affected by morality when you view it from that standpoint. Chapter three was a doozy, a heck of a chapter, which um, addressed how Christian ethics can can interact with uh, other related fields like behavioral sciences and what he calls art and technique. So to see that third video for that. Chapter four was a little shorter um, and touched on whether or not there really is a distinctive Christian ethics and what it is. Um, he says that there is a distinctive Christian ethics and he's gonna revisit that here at the beginning of chapter five. So let's jump on in. Chapter five is called Christian Ethics According to St. Paul. So we're gonna really dive now into scripture, um, something he accuses modern ethicists of neglecting. Um, he says that some modern ethicists don't return to scripture as a primary source and he says that this affects how they read scripture as well. So the first point he has is a clarification. He asks again, is there such a thing as Christian ethics? And he's going to dive a little bit deeper into the question um, that he introduced in the last chapter. He says, answering moral questions using, uh, using scripture depends heavily on what kind of questions you ask. Right? He says a solid exegesis or uh, inter uh, interpretation interpretation of the text is is very important is very necessary here um, and he identifies the usual method used by recent by modern ethics he says ethicists will look for moral precepts in the new in the new testament that aren't found anywhere in the old testament or in other traditions and claim that what's left that these passages that this is uniquely christian ethics he says the problem is that there are really only kind of two passages in the New Testament that really meet this criteria. Um, those are John's new commandment of love for one another in, in the Gospel of John and Matthew's forgiveness of enemies in the Sermon on the Mount. These two passages um, he identifies as the only two that might meet this criteria of being unique. Um, but he says that even these two can sort of be implied, especially in the Old Testament and in other traditions. Um, and the modern ethicist, it's, it's far easier for the modern ethicist to claim that there really is no unique Christian ethics and sort of kind of, uh, you know, recognize those two passages as being implicit in other traditions. It's far easier to do that than to try to base a whole unique Christian ethics on just those two passages, right? But he identifies a problem, he says there's two outstanding flaws with this method, with this usual method, right? And the first of those flaws is the original categories used. Um, he says that this method projects a morality of obligation, remember he hates that, uh, onto St. Paul's teaching, which is for him a big no-no. He says this leads to a rift between dogma and morality, and between morality and exhortation. This presumption has become habitual in modern exegesis. Um, for St. Paul and the ancients, the leitmotif of morality was happiness and salvation. Its chief concern, the teaching of the virtues, 
and those qualities of heart and mind that lead to God. So happiness and salvation, not obligation and rule following, right? Its chief concern is the teaching of the virtues, right? Which are a positive, uh, sort of a positive approach as opposed to a negative approach which identifies the don'ts, right? Virtue ethics, it's so cool. Okay, this method, we're still in point one here. This method limits passages on morality to strict imperative texts. Um, so, so looking, looking for these uh, passages on morality in the New Testament, by looking at uh, from a perspective of obligation, your search is is limited to only those passages which contain strictly imperative texts. Do this, don't do that, right? Pinkera says, but it's clear that St. Paul continually re returns to the virtues in his ex exhortatory passages. That's a hard word. In his exhortation passages, right? Um, virtue ethics is how we need to interpret St. Paul and his commentators. Virtue ethics, again. There's the second flaw, <clears throat> and he identifies the flaw and uh, the method by which he's going to proceed. And those two methods are fragmented, that's the flaw, and the total method, which is, which is what he's going to use. He says, uh, a problem in procedure, which might be called residual or fragmented, is the second flaw. When you break down the text in order to eliminate non-unique material, um, you're fragmenting the text against the author's intent, he says. He says it's like trying to compare one person's face with another person's face by eliminating all the features that they have in common, which is insane, right? Uh, what you need to do is take a look at both of those faces and, and view them holistically as a whole face in order to recognize the differences. That's how we do, that's how we do that anyways, right? And that's how he identifies his total method, um, which he's going to use. He has, you have to look at the whole picture in order to see how it contrasts with other systems. Um, and then he uses the example of the Our Father in Matthew. He says that no clause, no section, no sentence, no piece of the Our Father is technically unique. You can find each of those things in other passages in Scripture or in other traditions. But taken as a whole, the whole Our Father, especially in the context of the address, which is Our Father, Abba, right? Um, by which Jesus reveals God to us, right? Abba. When you look at the whole text in that context, it stands out in bold relief and even gives each petition an eschatological, eschatological overtones, which is to say um, a view towards the end of the world, right? The, 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 the four last things. So, um, looking at the Our Father, for example, from a from a broad context, and and recognizing um, not simply imperative texts, but the whole uh, the whole message of the text of the, the, the scripture, you can see how it is in stark contrast to other systems. He's gonna he's we're gonna um, sort of uh, tease this out as we go along. He says, the New Testament authors are at pains to show how their teaching is in continuity with the Old Testament, right? We should expect to see similar, similar language from in the New and the Old. In the case of um, Paul, in Paul's letters, that's true also for Greek thought. He wants to use um, Greek philosophy and categories in his own writing, right? There's a continuity there. This doesn't mean that the teachings of the New Testament can't transcend the traditions they build on, the Jewish and the Greek traditions, right? They absolutely can. Um, but in the fragmented method, uh, we're trying to find, the, the, the ethicists who use that method are trying to find unique passages. But this is diametrically opposed to the intention of the authors, right? If you're an author trying to build on the text of the Old Testament, trying to show how it's been um, fulfilled or, or transcended, you're going to use the same language. But if you're going in looking how, and, and trying to find places that they're the same and canceling those out, you're, you, that's the exact opposite of what the authors intended, right? So Pink Air says, we should rely on exegesis and not on our a priori, a priori assumptions. So he cites a couple of examples of how people might do this. He says, humanists presume that philosophical and cultural heritage historically precede Christian data. And he says, Protestants, on the other hand, presume that texts uh, need to be purified 
of the old law and philosophy. So here are a couple of errors that err on either side of the issue here. The goal of the total method, that's Pink Air's uh, method by which he's going to proceed, and really kind of the goal of the whole book, is to reestablish the relationship between scripture and moral theory so that the latter, moral theory, may become once more truly Christian. Okay, the goal of, of this chapter and of really the whole book. Okay, so that was, um, that was the first section which uh, uh, clarified whether there really is a Christian ethics and clarified the issues therein a little bit more. Now we're getting really into St. Paul. Okay, and the first section is called the confrontation between gospel preaching, Jewish justice, and Greek wisdom. So Paul encounters two concepts of morality. Jewish concern for law and justice, right? And Greek concern for wisdom and the classical virtues. Um, and Pink Harris is going to look primarily at Romans and 1 Corinthians um, to, to really see how these, um, these systems interact and come into conflict with each other. Um, Jewish moral theory is based on honoring the covenant with God by following his commands. So that's the law that, that Paul talks about, right? Greek morality is oriented towards wisdom, and it's built on Plato's dialogues, Aristotle's ethics, and the Stoics' teaching on virtues. Okay, so that's the background for the Greek um, philosophy that Paul is going to use and build on. There's also, in these two traditions, kind of thrown in Roman political honesty, he says, and law. So this Roman uh, preoccupation with law is also sort of in the air that Paul's breathing. Christian theology synthesizes Greek categories, namely wisdom, virtues, and happiness, with Jewish law, particularly the Decalogue, um, informing its moral system, its Christian moral system. And these elements are still the foundation of Western society today, despite what you might hear, right? That's undeniably true. But the way that Paul goes about this is interesting. The first thing he does is attack these two systems, the Greek and the Jewish. Um, he calls out the corruption in both of these traditions, and he demolished the pretensions of Greek and Jewish morality, it says. Um, but then he goes on to sort of re, uh, reassimilate uh, these two traditions and, and build on them. Paul's writing, writings offer an answer and a fulfillment for both Jew and Greek. And the, what he does is he introduces a new virtue, and this is so important. A new virtue, faith in Jesus, crucified and risen, and become for all the source of God's justice and wisdom. This is the foundation stone of morality for Paul, faith. And he's gonna, the main chunk of this chapter is going to be talking about that. Um, this gives the desire for wisdom and justice a new source, right? It's not a human virtue, but the virtue of God in Christ. Pink Ayers and Paul obviously have some high words for the virtue of faith. Um, he says, Pink Ayers says that pride is what vitiated Jewish justice and Greek wisdom. And the solution is humility. And this touches on something that I have always kind of wondered about, which is, you know, pride, if pride is that greatest of uh, vices, the greatest of sins, um, it would seem that its opposite, humility, would be the greatest of virtues. But the tradition kind of comes back and tells us that really charity is the queen of the virtues, right? Uh, and that's actually language that Pink Harris uses later. He's going to affirm that, that, that charity is really the, the highest of virtues. So how is it that humility and faith, which now Pink Harris is and Paul is claiming to be the foundation of morality, how is it that humility, faith, and charity interact, right? Which is the greatest which, which is a subcategory of the others. <laughs> um, I've always wondered about this, and he's going to kind of go on to, to answer this uh, in a fascinating way. Um, so humility is the answer to pride. And he goes on to say, Faith is humility before the truth of a humble word, telling us of the one who humbled himself even to the obedience of the cross. Because faith entrusts oneself to another, namely God, it is supremely humble. So faith is humility, right? 
He says, pride or faith, self-confidence or trust in Jesus, closing in upon oneself or a humble, docile opening to the Spirit. This is the decisive choice St. Paul places at the frontier of all human moral systems. Okay? And here's the real answer to this faith-humility uh, relationship. This section is called the person of Jesus. Oh, so good. Paul places a person, Jesus, at the center of Christian morality. Jesus is not merely an example or an expounder of some high morality, right? But his very body, which suffered and was raised, becomes the source and cause of the new holiness and wisdom offered to us by God. This is, this is key. This is the center, right? Christ is the center. He's sort of the nexus by which we understand the relationship between the theological virtues and the, the natural virtues, like the cardinal virtues, where he's going to go into that. Faith in Jesus is humility, right? Because Jesus is humble. That's how faith, how do faith and humility interact? And later we'll see charity. Well, in the person of Christ. Oh, it's so good. Um, since Christ is our goal, communi communion with him, every action that we, ha every action we do has a supernatural and transcend transcendental thrust which transforms our interior life, right? Um, Christ frees us from the subtle despair of systems which fail to impose our intentions onto our actions because of human weakness. So he thinks that Greek wisdom, the aspiration for wisdom, or Jewish justice, the, the um, pursuit of, of real justice, these things are, are really kind of outside of human attainment because of human weakness. There's a subtle, he, he describes it as a subtle despair. And what's the answer? Well, Christ is the answer, yet again, right? With the knowledge that Jesus has borne our sufferings and punishment, and by the grace of his healing balm on our nature, the Spirit produces works in us that are ours and done by us, yet come from another source, nobler and more powerful than we, end quote. That's page 116. Um, and, and this is how... Um, Paul kind of resolves or begins to resolve the confrontation between justice and wisdom. It's in Christ, right? Christ is the foundation. Faith in him, to be more specific. So now he's going to talk about faith in a little bit more detail. Uh, this section's entitled, Faith, the Source of Pauline Morality. Faith for Paul is active, operative, and practical. Later methods, the methods he's, he's critical of, separate dogma from morality. Um, and, he, 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 and he says Protestants further this separation by also separating faith and works, right? Um, faith in Jesus, he says, should be seen as penetrating the entire life of the believer. So faith is kind of antecedent to and informing works, right? Faith gives birth to a new being. Faith, through baptism, transforms us. Um, and that transformation takes place on an ontological as well as a practical level. So this is the first point in eight points he's going to give that, uh, about faith. How faith um, informs the moral life. And this point number one is that faith, give births, faith gives birth to a new being. Right. So faith through baptism transforms us. And that transformation, that baptismal regeneration... Um, takes place ontologically. It's a, it is a regeneration. It's a rebirth. But it also affects our practical moral lives. And he's going to go on to show how this works. Um, he, he, uh, he cites uh, the famous conversion story of, Paul, of the French poet Paul Claudel uh, as an example of this. Paul Claudel was uh, at a Christmas mass at Notre Dame in Paris um, in the late 19th century and um, during the Mass, he had this, God graced him with a supernatural conversion of heart um, by which he, he was changed. His whole, the whole course of his life was changed, um, which entailed a practical change as well as, uh, as that spiritual change, right? So, uh, that's amazing. The second point um, is called the, trans, the transformation of personality. He says, um, and he cites in Paul the, uh, this opposition between the old man and the new man. Paul says, like, put on the new man, right? 
um, through the active presence of Christ in the personality of the new man, suffering and death are, as it were, driven back, already vanquished, and they become the instruments of a new hope. So there's a transformation in personality that takes place with, um, with, the faith in, with faith in Christ, with ascent to the faith in Christ. Point three is conversion, life according to the Spirit. Um, <clears throat> St. Paul talks about life according to the flesh and life according to the Spirit. He sort of uh, opposes these. Life according to the flesh uh, constitutes evil carnal desires and ends in death. Life according to the Spirit is characteristic of attraction to spiritual things and ends in life. Um, the Holy Spirit isn't limited to proposing virtues. It doesn't like propose virtues from a distance, right? It is the principle of new life in the believer, which by the merits of the passion, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, produce in us the fruits of the Spirit. He says, a system cannot be Christian, or at least Pauline, if it does not give a predominant place to the action of the Holy Spirit. Oh, so good. Christian mor morality is Christological, and it gives a foundational place to the action of the Holy Spirit inside the believer, who gives assent to the faith, to, who gives assent um, to Jesus Christ in faith. Right? Faith is the foundation, which allows faith in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, is the foundation which, um, which allows the Holy Spirit to work in a real way inside the believer. The fourth point is life in Christ and the imitation of Christ. He says, by the power of the resurrection, the Spirit forms us in the image of Christ. Okay? The theme of imitation that you find in St. Paul relates to the theme of the image of God. Genesis. Right? Within each person. Restored by Christ, the image of the Father. So, imitation takes on a deeper spiritual and ontological meaning than the word imitation might, uh, might convey. Biblical imitation is not about acting how virtuous people act. It's not like copying, as it were, right? But it's about allowing the Spirit to act in you to conform you to the new life of Christ, which in turn gives rise to devotion to God and neighbor. And that leads us on to the fifth point, which is charity, right? But this is so important. Uh, Paul's idea about imitation is... Um, it really goes all the way back to the beginning, to Genesis, right? Being made in the image and likeness of God. Well, by imitating Christ, right? It's not, not merely copying. The Holy Spirit brings about an ontological change. That is a change in being, which conforms us to Christ, who is the image of the Father. It's, it's the beginning of divinization, right? Which, which the fathers so often talk about. Um, and... And uh, he says this last end, right? It gives rise to devotion to God and neighbor, namely charity. And this is that fifth point. <clears throat> but, so charity, the fifth point is charity, the Holy Spirit's greatest gift. <clears throat> uh, I love this. Um, Paul's moral theory, base, so this, this answers the question that I had before, how do charity, faith, and uh, humility interact. Paul's moral theory is based on faith and it centers on charity. And we'll talk about humility again later on. It's based on faith. Faith is the beginning, the foundation, but it centers on charity. This is what it all sort of culminates in. Charity is the greatest gift of the Spirit. It is the bond of perfection, as Paul describes it. Um, Love gives effect to our faith. He quotes the Jerusalem Bible, which has a note um, in one of the Pauline letters. Love gives effect to our faith, right? It, 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 um, it puts action into faith. It puts faith into action, I should say. Um, the word charity, uh, caritas in Latin, agape in Greek, is new and unique. It's a love that surpasses all human sentiments. Its source is God. It is the love of the Father manifested in the gift of the Son and communicated by the Holy Spirit. 
For Paul, real charity is impossible without faith. And then he drops this bomb. It's so cool. The essence of Christian morality, he just says, kind of out of the blue here. And he quotes Galatian chapter two, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, where Paul says, I live in faith, faith in the Son of God who loved me and who sacrificed himself for my sake. So faith is the foundation. I live in faith. Faith in the Son of God in Christ, who loved me, agape, right? And who sacrificed himself in humility for my sake. Faith, uh, charity, and humility. Charity claims another essence than uh, mere human love. But through Christ, by the power of the Spirit, charity can broaden and deepen those mere human loves and give them a divine dimension, right? Um, so mere human loves being like, uh, in Greek, like eros and philia, um, I'm forgetting the, the fourth one, um, in Latin, uh, I'm not remembering the Latin, this is to say that all those human, merely human loves can be transformed by charity, which is, the, which is the, the culmination of Christian morality and spirituality. Um, Paul tends to, so now we're, gonna, we're, we're continuing to, to describe charity. Paul tends to describe agape, charity, in terms of the mundane personal life of the Christian. Um, this has led some theologians and ethicists to think that charity is only applicable in one's personal life, right? But he's going to go on to describe how this works. Um, he quotes uh, Paul, who says, like, love is patient, love is kind. These are very personal uh, descriptions of how love works in a person's life. Pinkers goes on to say, but it is also the bonding agent which makes the church Christ's body. Thus, Paul's moral teaching rallied under charity contains a calling to unity, unity in the church, in this communal uh, understanding of charity. So there's a personal and a communal element. It's relevant in, in, in a personal element, as Paul describes in clear fashion, but also in a communal element um, as it relates to the body of Christ and, and the church um, being unified therein. He says, charity is the sovereign virtue, the queen of the virtues, because it unites the opposite extremes of the Christian life. It delights in the smallest virtues, which bring humility into ordinary life, humility. Supported by these, it includes all dimensions of the church, transcending purely human views and obstacles. So let me read how this humility comes into effect again. Charity is the sovereign virtue because it unites the opposite extremes of human life. It delights in the smallest virtues, which bring humility into ordinary life, right? So faith give, gives rise to charity. Faith is the foundation stone for charity to spring forth in one's soul by the grace of Christ, which then in turn um, delights in the smallest virtues which bring humility into ordinary life. So humility is the fruit of charity, which is the fruit of faith faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see how Christ is the very center. Christ truly is the cornerstone. And faith in him gives rise to the theological virtue of charity, which enables humility, which makes humility uh, of, the, of the astounding kind that you see in the saints and in the Lord possible. Right? Whew. Point number six, assimilating the human virtues. Um, so remember how Paul first kind of smashed Jewish and Greek wisdom and justice um, and then reappropriates them? He's going to talk a little bit more about this here in, in, in point number six. He says, faith and charity must make use of human virtues in order to be effective. Faith and charity, those theological virtues, those high, uh, beautiful um, virtues of, that Paul describes, they actually have to make use of human virtues, Right? So there might be a tendency to sort of dispense with, like, let's get rid of Greek thought. You see some of the fathers doing this. Um, we don't need the Greeks. We have Christ, right? 
Well, faith and charity have to use human virtues, right? They don't exist. Uh, uh, they, in order to, to act in our lives, they have to make use of our day-to-day -day virtues, so to speak. Paul returns to those Greek categories, um, which some would view as a concession, like I just said, a concession to uh, pagan philosophy. And some uh, w would uh, view it as humanistic, like um, that Paul is, 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 that Christian ethics doesn't really exist, it's just real, it's just human. It's just a use of human ethics, right? But Pinkeros, of course, thinks it's more complicated than that. In this point six, he says there are two stages in Paul's morality. And this is a breakdown of how Paul had smashed and then reassimilated. He says, the utter humiliation and abjection of Christ is in opposition to the supposed wisdom and justice of the world. He says, you know, uh, I preach Christ and him crucified. This is a scandal to, uh, uh, he says, a scandal to the justice of the Jews and pure folly to the wisdom of the Greeks, right? So he's so, sort of um, like breaking forth in opposition to those two systems. He says, the Christian must be humbled and follow Christ. Right? So first, there's a complete break from the wisdom and justice of the world. But then, after setting this as the foundation, then he can reintroduce classical Greek virtues. And he does this uh, principally so in Philippians. But even here in Philippians, the reintroduction of those Greek virtues is, in, when read in context, is explicitly and thoroughly uh, Christian. So it's Christian through and through. But there is, it is possible, and Paul does it, he reintroduces the Greek categories and the Greek virtues. These are not contraries. The Greek and uh, Jewish like philosophies or systems of the world and, um, the, and the virtues of the theological virtues of the Christian. They're not contraries. But there are two aspects in the movement of faith in the formation of Christian morality. So St. Paul, the language Pinkeris uses is he, he salvages human virtues by using faith in Christ as the cornerstone of his moral system. And he goes on to describe how this happens by, uh, um, by showing how virtues don't exist as individual concepts, right? He says, virtues are dependent upon the organism into which they are adopted. For Christians, this organism is Christ and the moral system springing out of Christianity. Um, which is guided and catalyzed by the, by the theological virtues. So I think it's helpful to think about how um, a virtue might be um, different, might be have a different meaning um, in the context that it's in. So if you think about like, mm, say, uh, say uh, Marx, say take the take the virtue of, of prudence for example. Um, the Marxist might be prudent. Um, but but his prudence, because his end is like maybe the good of the state or um, the the common good uh, of the community or something like this, right? It's it's purely natural. Prudence is going to look different based on that end. Um, take a I don't know a, a materialist or like a I don't know like a Darwinist or some something. Um, the good that he, he sees as the end of his life is like maybe the continuation of the species. So what's prudent, an action that is prudent, which has that end is gonna look different, again, from that Marxist. And now, a Christian, uh, enlivened by grace, will have as his goal the furthering of the kingdom of God. So prudence in that context is gonna have yet another different um, flavor to it. Prudence by itself is not, it's, you can't really understand the virtue in, in a vacuum. Right? It has to be understood in its context, in the organism in which it's been adopted. And um, that's how Pink Harris kind of shows how these things are not at, at odds with each other, but rather Christianity provides a context um, in which to understand the virtues. And those virtues can be given that supernatural, um, divine uh, sort of aspect, element, when they're subsumed under a Christian understanding. Of morality. That's point number six. Point number seven. We're getting uh, close to the end here. Bear with me. Seven. The transformation of the virtues. So in considering cases of conscience, Paul uh, will make observations according to nature, 
reason, or common sense. But then he will leap beyond those and ask how it relates to Christ. So um, one example, uh, I can't remember which letter this is from, but Paul talks about fornication. And he talks about how, um, like, uh, food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach is meant for food. Um, and he draws some kind of, like, um, sort of teleological uh, examples from the natural world um, why one shouldn't fornicate. But then he goes on to say, like, uh, that that uh, the Christian, um, is his body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and how he would be offending the Spirit of God to fornicate, right? So he, he'll, he'll cite, like, a, a reason why one should act a certain way from natural philosophy or from common sense or from nature, or reason or something like this, but then he'll go beyond that and provide a Christian context to that. Um, and that's what makes it, you know, uniquely Christian. Um, Pink Harris says that we ought to handle all of our individual and specific cases of conscious, conscience in like manner. Using natural philosophy, reason, yes, absolutely. Fully um, use those to their full extent. But then go beyond that and relate it to Christ. That's how we should be um, functioning in the world in specific cases of conscience. Um, he goes on to, to describe how Paul um, talks about family relationships. He says, in family relationships, Paul is not concerned with equality like we are today. Um, he more, Paul more or less takes the circumstances of family life for granted, how the wife is very much subordinate to the husband, right? But... Since there is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, in the church, and since charity is the operative principle in Christian moral life, Paul tells husbands and wives to submit to each other, like in Ephesians, for the sake of the Lord. Right? For the sake of the Lord. So again, Christ is the end um, and, the, and the principle of Christian morality, really the, the, the whole center of it. Um, and so you, that's sometimes people are you know bothered by the fact that Paul doesn't address slavery as a social evil or the, the stark um, uh, differentiation between men and women, husbands and wives. Uh, Paul sort of takes these for granted, but um, this these relationships are transformed in charity by faith in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit acting in us um, in grace, right? Pink Harris goes on to describe how Christian morality is a moral yeast that would gradually result in the more humanitarian customs and uh, more humanitarian customs and a recognition of the basic dignity and equality of persons. So he says that despite, you know, Paul not like specifically addressing the problem of, of of slavery, say, for example. Um, the principle of charity uh, is the seed which which addresses those problems later on. It's the yeast, the moral yeast, that results eventually in the recognition of the dignity and equality of each individual person and then uh, shed light on the evil of slavery, right? Point number eight is called just restructuring. Here he's going to talk about some key uh, virtues that Paul uh, brings up often. First, humility, again. Humility is a special virtue of Christ. There, w there could be no charity without humility. right? So remember how before I said uh, faith gives rise, rise to charity, which gives rise to humility? Well, there's this sort of uh, ascending, uh, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an order, a, a chronological order, but these things are also interacting within each other. There could be no charity without humility, right? Humility was indispensable for receiving the word of God in faith, and the fathers saw humility as the foundation of the spiritual life, right? So, whereas faith is the foundation of the whole Christian life and the moral life, humility is really the foundation of that spiritual life. And humility um, interacts with, with charity to... Um, to put faith into action. Um, he talks about chastity. This is a theme for Paul. Chastity is really important. 
Chastity is not simply a refrain from like pagan life, pagan action, but it um, honors God, who re but sorry, excuse me. By chastity, one honors God, who redeemed him, and joined himself to him. Further, the body, being the temple of the Spirit, um, chastity honors the work of the Spirit. Right? So chastity is not simply like, don't do the, the evil stuff the pagans are doing. But it's a recognition that um, God redeemed my body. And it's a recognition that the Spirit has made my body the temple of the Lord. And so by acting against chastity, you're sinning not against your own body, not only against your own body, but against the Spirit of the Lord and God himself. Um, so because of this, this uh, grand understanding of chastity, virginity becomes an ideal, right? Not as a denial of sexual pleasure, but as taking the Lord Jesus as one's spouse. It's something that's positive, that looks beyond. It's not merely a denial of the flesh. Finally, joy and peace are really important for St. Paul. And Pinkera says that uh, the um, characteristic tone of Pauline, Pauline morality uh, contains joy and peace. These are characteristics of Paul's morality. Paul sometimes exhorts Christians to rejoice in the midst of persecution, which seems almost silly, right? Um, these are the direct effects of uh, charity, and it should not be ignored as a fruit of Christian morality. Joy and peace are the direct effects of charity and should not be ignored as a fruit of Christian morality. Those are those eight points under faith, right? And in conclusion, Pinkera says, don't forget that Christ is the center. Christian morality is Christological, so important. Paul's morality can also be described as Trinitarian, Christ being the manifestation of the Father's love and the gift of the Spirit given for sanctification. And remember also that for Paul, dogma and morality are not separated, they are united, and there is no distinction for him between morality, spirituality, and exhortation. So, um, that's the whole chapter. Next, he's going to go on to talk about um, the Sermon on the Mount, which is exciting because those are the words of the Lord himself. But um, as we're getting through this, and as we've begun to delve into Scripture now, specifically St. Paul, I think the application in my life is starting to come forward. I'm starting to think about how this can change the way that I pray and um, how I view my own sin and, you know, even like how I go to confession. I think that the application of this work by Pink Harris, by re, um, re-assimilating scripture into morality, is, uh, is going to help me, and I think it could help everyone, view the moral life uh, with more clarity and more joy, and, uh, and in, a more, in a way that reflects reality better. Um, I'm thinking about almost doing a case study and seeing how um, taking, you know, one uh, sin that, that, people, that many people struggle with, maybe, um, and taking that and analyzing it from a perspective of, like a, of, of the manuals which look at it in terms of only of obligation, and then taking it and analyzing it from this perspective and seeing how uh, a view of that sin and the virtue which conquers it uh, would differ for in those two systems of morality, and I think that that would be very helpful to um, see how it could how this could be applied to one's daily life um, in a way that could make us holier. So that'd be good. <laughs> Thanks for uh, listening. This is chapter five. Next is chapter six, entitled "The Sermon on the Mount in Christian Ethics." Thanks for watching and listening. See you next time.